to start recording. Um, so we will have this up on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days if you'd like to uh, replay any of it. Everyone also should have received the handout that Beth put together for our program tonight. Um, I attached that um, with the Zoom link tonight. And I'm assuming she's going to take Q&A at the end. Definitely. So go, so go ahead and type those into the chat or the Q&A um, throughout today's program. And she'll get to those toward uh, the end of her presentation. So, all right, Beth, take it away. I am thrilled to be back here at Elove Public Library. And um, as you know, around the world, Chicago is recognized as an architectural wonder. From towering skyscrapers to intricate mosaics, Chicago is home to some of the most stunning and historic architecture in the world. Its buildings are a testament to the rich history and culture. In this presentation, we will explore some of Chicago's hidden gems. We'll take a closer look at some of the stories behind these wonders and discover what makes them so significant. Before we start our slide presentation, let me just say that I wanna give you the briefest history of Chicago that you'll ever have. I wanna tell you that in 1673, Marquette and Joliet were exploring the upper Mississippi River. In 1862, De La Salle was exploring the upper Mississippi River. In 1780, Jean Petit Point du Sable came as the first non-indigenous inhabitant. He actually built a trading post at what is now Wacker in Michigan. He was phenomenal. He could speak several European languages. His wife of the Potawatomi tribe could speak indigenous languages and they were phenomenal at their trading post. They also had like a bed and breakfast. They could do anything. And they did extremely well. And now Lakeshore Drive is finally honoring our first settler. 1803, they started building Fort Dearborn right next to the trading post at Michigan and Wacker. And if you look down in the sidewalk at Michigan and Wacker, you will see that it says, this is the site of Fort Dearborn. 1833, Chicago was incorporated as a town, 300 residents. 1837, Chicago's incorporated as a city. And then I bet you've heard about the Great Fire, 1871. The city was basically built of wood, wood houses, wood sidewalks, all wood. After the fire, word got out all over the world we needed engineers, carpenters, craftsmen, anyone who could build engineers, you name it, we needed them. And yes, people came flocking to Chicago. We rebuilt Chicago. 1893, only 60 years after we were incorporated, the World's Columbian Exposition was held here in Chicago and we had 1 million residents. We are considered the fastest growing city in the history of the world. So with that, let's start. We are going to the Marquette Building. It is at 140 South uh, Dearborn. And you say, I don't have any idea where this is located. So I'm gonna just take you across the street so you get an idea. This is Dearborn and Adams. Right across the street is Federal Plaza with the Flamingo sculpture. You're hopping across uh, Adams here at Dearborn, and we're entering the lobby of the Marquette Building. It is magnificent mosaics by Lewis Comfort Tiffany Studios. It is luster Tiffany glass, mother of pearl, semi-precious stones. It is gorgeous. 
let's go on the second floor and look above the elevators. There are sculptures of the indigenous people and the explorers who explored this region. So you have 22 portraits, 11 on each floor, who were directly or indirectly connected with the discovery or exploration of the Great Northwest and the Mississippi River and Valley. Edward Kemmies is the artist, and you might know that he did the lions at the Art Institute. He did 22 of these portraits. You have Marquette, Chief Chicago, uh, Joliet La de La Salle, and you also have uh, Black Hawk and Fontenac and Brown Moose. But what really amazed me is I was downtown in 2016, and I bet you remember it was euphoria in Chicago. The Cubs had just won the World Series and every sculpture in Chicago had either a Cubs jersey or a Cubs cap. And I thought that we should document this. It was wonderful. This building is a phenomenal building. Let me just take you back to the main area. It has been restored, it is pristine, and why? Maybe if it was any building, it could be restored, but it is now owned by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. They have done a phenomenal job. Let me tell you that there is something very special going on in Chicago. We are finally coming to terms with the fact that we are living on someone else's land. And in the lobby of the Marquette building is our land acknowledgement plaque. And I will read you part of it. But this is now going, when you go to the theater at Goodman or Steppenwolf, they will read the land acknowledgement before performances. If you go on the river walk directly opposite the Chicago Architecture Center is the land acknowledgement. And now I will read briefly of what our land acknowledgement says. The MacArthur Foundation's Chicago office is situated on the lands of the Potawatomi people. They were the stewards of this land and lived, loved, and cared for it until forced out by non-native settlers tribes that have historical relationship with the lands in greater Chicago and Northern Illinois through trade, travel, and habitation also include the Ottawa, Ojibwa, Peoria, Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and other tribes whose names have been lost as a result of genocide and ethnocide of European colonialism and United States expansionism. This land continues to be home to indigenous people. Chicago is home to one of the largest urban indigenous populations in the United States. And I think that uh, we have to think about that. I think it's now time to go and see other extraordinary places and spaces in Chicago. We have now gone to Randolph, Michigan, and Washington. And here, this is the home of the very first Chicago Public Library, the People's Palace. And let's think back. There was the Great Fire, 1871. There were wooden houses and wooden sidewalks. There was no public library in 1871. But don't tell Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom because she felt terrible when she heard about the fire. People all over the world felt terrible. They were sending all sorts of things to Chicago. But 
It was Queen Victoria who told the people of England that we lost all of our books. And she said, we must send books to Chicago. Books started arriving on cargo ships and container ships. Chicago was receiving so many books, we built silos to house the books. And then our great founding father said, we need a proper library. We need a magnificent library that is definitely, definitely dignified for the people of Chicago. But they realized that we had a soot problem. Not everybody realized we had a soot problem, but we had railroads. And yes, they were causing a lot of black soot all over Chicago. But they chose to, they chose glass and marble that were practical as well as aesthetic because these materials could be last indefinitely and could be easily cleaned. So let's go inside the very first library. And this is the entryway in the Washington Street lobby. And you see these magnificent rare marbles. The white marble is Italian Carrera from the same source as the marble used by Michelangelo for his sculpture. There's green marble from Ireland. Now you see the intricate way that the gems and the materials and the lustrous glass and colored stone and mother of pearl and gold leaf and mosaic, they're all interconnected. They're inlaid at an angle. And when you inlay it at an angle, it reflects the light. And this term is called cosmati. And we have beautiful Cosmati work all throughout the, this is now called the Cultural Center, but it is our first library. And we have two magnificent domes in the building. We have the Grand Army of the Republic Dome, and that is 40 feet in diameter and leaded glass. And this is in honor of the Union soldiers of the Civil War. It is a National Veterans Memorial. And then the Tiffany Dome in Preston Bradley Hall, that's 38 feet in diameter, but it is the largest glass Tiffany Dome in the United States. And it sparkles. And this is absolutely a magnificent a uh, hall and a and, uh, building, but it didn't stay beautiful. We had a problem. It started getting old and it wasn't modern enough and the electricity wasn't modern enough. And the great wise men of Chicago said, we can tear it down. And Mayor Daley, the first Mayor Daley was mayor then and his wife, sis, Eleanor Daley said, no, you're not tearing down the people's palace. We will restore it to its original beauty. And that is what happened. It was restored. 1991, the building became the Chicago Cultural Center. And it is magnificent. And now you know that we have the Harold Washington Library. We have beautiful walls. Uh, that have mosaics and every language. And they're basically telling you that books and printing are very important. And it, there's quotes in every language. But the quote I love best is right here over the entryway, over the beautiful arch. And it's over the main entrance. It honors Benjamin Franklin Maybe you can see it. It says founder of the circulating library. And it is a magnificent building. But let's go. The front door has a remnant of cows on parade. Maybe you remember 1999, we had 
fiberglass cows up and down Michigan Avenue, and this cow was bronzed, and he is now a talking statue. But what's beautiful in the rear of the cultural center, we have a very large mural now. It's called Rushmore, and it honors 20 of the most influential women in Chicago's arts and culture. It was during Mayor Rahm Emanuel's term when he decided and the aldermen voted that we should have a year of public art and therefore 50 wards each got new public art. This was designed by Carrie James Marshall in 2017 and painted by Jeffrey Zimmerman because Carrie Marshall doesn't go on scaffolding. This is beautiful. We are honoring uh, Jackie Taylor of the Black Ensemble Theater and Maggie Daly and Oprah Winfrey and Ruth Page. And there are 20 wonderful women all on this mural in the rear in Garland Court, in the rear of the Cultural Center. I think it's extraordinary. Let's continue to the Second Presbyterian Church. It is at 20th and Michigan Avenue, and it used to be called 20th, it's now Cullerton. But this church is famous for its Tiffany stained glass windows. It's also famous because after the great fire, some of our wealthiest millionaires left the proper Chicago, the very center, and they moved south to about 20th, to about where Glessner House is. So it was Robert Todd Lincoln and Philip Armour and George Pullman and Marshall Field. They all built mansions on Prairie Avenue, two blocks east of Michigan Avenue. And where did they pray? They had to pray at the most proper church. And yes, this church was considered for the finest people. They built it of stone, Indiana limestone, you see on the top left. And it was famous, it is famous for its gold tree of life beautiful uh, mural that's hanging there. It was just restored in 2023. It was dark and sooty looking and the gold angels are overhead. But what is really very well known about this church is that the great wise millionaires did not want religious stained glass. They wanted nature scapes. So they have beside the still waters and the angel and lilies that was actually displayed at the world's Columbian exposition. And you have the famous Tiffany river scene where you always have irises and jewels. This was the church when um, President Grover Cleveland came to Chicago to go to the world's fair. He stopped here to pray first. And this is the place to be seen. It is um, absolutely magnificent. And that gold tree of life was from 1903. And it just had extensive restoration for its grime and soot. And uh, let's continue because I think Marshall Fields is extraordinary. Marshall Fields actually was the place to be. 1891, Marshall Field installed the first great clock, seven and a half tons. You met at the corner of State and Washington. Women were going shopping. How were they going to find their coach driver? Well, they were told to meet under the clock. Or what if they were meeting a friend or relative? meet under the clock. It became so crowded that in 1897, State and Randolph got the second clock. 
equally as heavy. But what is absolutely magnificent is the interior. But the famous saying was, meet me under the clock at Marshall Fields. Now, I know that the interior is magnificent. It is the largest Tiffany ceiling of in the United States. It was commissioned by John Shedd, and the design is again by Lewis Comfort Tiffany Studios. 50 men and were on scaffolding for two years. And this is over 6,000 square feet. It's comprised of 1.6 million pieces of iridescent glass. It is magnificent. If you want, you could go up to the fifth floor, women's lingerie, and you can see it very close up. That's where I'm taking this picture. Uh, in 2006, this built the Marshall Fields became Macy's. It is gorgeous. We are traveling to where to west of where the fair was, the World's Columbian Exposition. If you go west on the Midway Plaisance, you will get to where Laredo Taft decided he wanted to make a, a sculpture. He envisioned an enormous sculpture. Laredo Taft was one of the artists at, of the World's Fair. And after the fair, oh, he came to Chicago, of course, after the fire. And he became an art professor at the Art Institute and then at the University of Chicago. And he heard a poem and he believed that he had to do something about this. So there was a poem, it's called Paradox of Time. And the poem has repeating couplets and he kept hearing it over and over in his head. Time goes, you say, ah, no, alas, time stays, we go. There were 100 human figures that he envisioned should be on this fountain of time, time marching by. Well, as it turns out, Laredo Taft wanted to carve it out of stone, but that would have been too costly, too, too time consuming. And he realized that he could use concrete. Concrete had been used in Greece but there was a newly invented type that was decorative and could be molded. And this sculpture is used of decorative concrete. This is not solid, it is hollow. And the only thing that they did not realize is that Chicago has very difficult weather. You might have seen that sometimes we have heat and sometimes we have extreme cold and sometimes we have ice and sleet. So this did not hold up as well as they had hoped and it had to be restored in 2007. And I was very, very, very fortunate to be able to be underneath and see some of the remodeling and the construction. But this is a magnificent, sculpture by Laredo Taft. It's called Fountain of Time. It has 100 human figures. It actually, um, uh, Laredo Taft, he needed models. He used his assistants, his students, his daughters. He even has a self-portrait in the rear. So, this is magnificent. It is due west on the uh, Plaisance. We will continue to some of my favorite extraordinary places. We're going to go to Garfield Park Field House. This gold dome building was constructed in 1928, and it's just known as the gold dome. 
But this is the very, very, the land here is the first park, Chicago Park. But it is, in, in addition, this was the first administrative building and then it became a field house. It is our finest field house. It is really used for karate and yoga and you name it, they have it in the field house. But look above the door. I can't enlarge it, but there is a sculpture of De La Salle. He is standing there. And this dome structure honors De La Salle. He traveled the Great Lakes. He claimed the Mississippi River Basin for France. And that was in 1682. But what I find very, very strange is that this architecture is really, it, it's uh, a Spanish Baroque style. And it has lots of images of the sea because he traveled the seas. It is magnificent. The gold leaf dome has been restored also. And um, this is two blocks from Garfield Conservatory, which is one of the largest and most stunning uh, botanical conservatories in the nation. This is at 100 North Central Park. We will travel to just opposite Lincoln Park. This is the Elks National Veterans Memorial. It is considered the most magnificent war memorial in the United States. That's what they say. And the Order of Elks, felt that they needed to honor the 1,000 plus members who died during World War I. They said, the, the, the Elks War Relief Commission was put in charge of finding a site and supervising the building's construction. So this is their recommendation in 1921. The Grand Lodge said, the suggested building be made definitely monumental and memorial in character, that the architectural design be so stately and beautiful, the material of its construction so enduring, its site and setting so appropriate, that the attention of all beholders will be arrested and the heart of every elk who contemplates it will be thrilled with pride and that it will for generations to come prove an inspiration to that loyalty and patriotism which the order so earnestly teaches and has so worthily exemplified. So the cornerstone was laid in 1924 and the building had to be of the highest, highest order. They wanted it to emulate just be of the finest material. So the Grand Order, the Grand Lodge said that the reception hall will emulate the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, Louis XIV's Versailles, Palace of Versailles. This will emulate the Hall of Mirrors to commemorate the armistice, the Treaty of Versailles, of November 11th, 1918, formally ending World War I. We will continue through the Elks Memorial. It is magnificent. We are now in Lakeview. Again, we're looking for extraordinary places in Chicago. And on Shamit was established in 1833, but this is the present location and, and that they moved to in 1929. During the Great Depression, they had six stained glass windows, and in 1941, there was vandalism, and one of the windows was destroyed. Well, the rabbi at that time was Rabbi Goldman, and he felt 
that they needed to design something that would actually appear that it has to be unique. And he viewed the American Jewish experience on a par with the biblical Jewish experience of coming to a new land. And here, to the best of my knowledge, this Liberty window with Abraham Lincoln on the far left and George Washington on the right, behind them are framed quotes. So with Abraham Lincoln, you have quotes from the Gettysburg Address and behind George Washington, you have quotes from the Declaration of Independence. And then in the middle frame, you have the immigrants hanging over the railing, coming into court and seeing the Statue of Liberty for the first time. They're coming into harbor from Europe. In addition to these panels, you also have the ceiling skylight that says all men are created equal in English and Hebrew. And there are many beautiful stained glass windows in many churches and many synagogues and temples. But I believe these are the most extraordinary. We are now traveling to Bronzeville. This neighborhood is phenomenal. 38th and Michigan Avenue. This is uh, 39th and Michigan Avenue. In the 30s and the 40s, there was uh, the Farm Security Administration, the FSA, the Photographic Documentation Project of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You probably heard of the WPA, the Works Progress Administration that did all the murals and wonderful things over the United States to keep our artists employed. We employed photographers and we are very fortunate that Russell Lee in 1941 spent a year in Bronzeville and Chicago documenting it. So, Russell Lee was considered the most prolific of the FSA photographers who documented the nation. And Lee was the most influential of the photographers. Bronzeville was a very special neighborhood. It was uh, pretty much the only community that African Americans could live in the city in 1941. Bronzeville is famous for jazz, blues, gospel, and Louis Armstrong lived there, and Nat King Cole, Sam Cooke, Quincy Jones. But what Russell Lee wanted to do was to capture the everyday average Bronzeville resident. So these are 10 photographic murals that go the length of Michigan Avenue. And it was Chris Devins, the artist and urban planner who found the negatives, enlarged the negatives, came up with a formula of very special wheat paste to affix them to these mountings and they are magnificent. One block north on Michigan Avenue at 38th, we see a mural. It is on Commonwealth Edison land, and the concerned citizens of Bronzeville felt that the lot should be cleaned up. It was an eyesore, a dumping spot, but this was, and still is, it is the, um, 
Uh, right here is where they have the behind here is the Commonwealth grid, but it is, now has these murals on boards that are affixed to the grid. So here on the far, far left, we are honoring the, the past and the potential future residents and through this, they're, they are honoring the black leaders and the activists in the community. From left to right is Katherine Johnson. And maybe you saw the phenomenal movie, Hidden Figures. Katherine Johnson is the brilliant mathematician who served as one of the brains behind the launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit. And next to her, is Gwendolyn Brooks. Next to Gwendolyn Brooks is Louis Latimer. He is the inventor of the incandescent light bulb. And next to him is Ida B. Wells. Maybe you can see her eyes looking to the future. Any portrait of Ida B. Wells, she is looking to the future. She definitely was a suffragette. She stood in front of, she was a journalist. She stood in front of the World's Fair and distributed pamphlets and said, boycott the World's Fair. They didn't hire any African-American black workers at all. So why should they celebrate this fair, she said. And then to the far right is the late Mayor Harold Washington. It is a 120 foot mural and it depicts the neighborhood's historic legacy. It's in partnership with ComEd, the community groups and the local artists. Then you have the students and the award recipients in the neighborhood also. At 47th and Dr. Martin Luther King Drive, is their cultural center. We have a cultural center in Skokie. There is one in Bronzeville. And what I really love is there are musicians on all four corners, the jazz musicians. They're priceless. They glisten in the sun when we have sun in Chicago. And this is the lobby of the cultural center. And it features all of their the great jazz musicians. a very special, extraordinary place in Chicago, Marina City. Why do I count this as extraordinary? Because in 1963, this was the tallest residential building in the world. It was in 1967, the tallest reinforced concrete building pre-pandemic. It had 1,400 residents, 13 businesses. And let us think about this. In the early, early 60s, Chicago was a ghost town. After people went to work, they went home. They did not stay downtown. There was There were no colleges then. Very little theater going on. It was only on the weekends. And here, Mayor Daley involved the uh, labor unions and Bertrand Goldberg. And they said, we have to fix this problem. And they came up with an idea that we should have a city within a city that people could live and you know, if you were downtown, there were no grocery stores, There's no supermarkets. So here in Marina City, you had restaurants, a supermarket, a beauty shop, a barber shop, a movie theater, a bank, travel agent. You, everybody needed their own travel agent. Gift shop, florist, people still brought lots of flowers and they weren't at your neighborhood, Jewel or Dominic's, and, or 
or Mariano's or Whole Foods then, a health club, a parking garage for your cars on the lower level. And then on the river, you have the marina. Because of course, if you can afford to live downtown, then of course you need to have your boat. But this Marina City is also known as the corn cobs because it, we do grow a lot of corns in, in the Midwest. But here, look, it was also used to film so many movies. Paramount Pictures filmed The Hunter in 1980. You see the car going off the parking lot. Well, that's Steve McQueen from The Hunter who was chasing the fugitive and he was on the spiral parking ramp and the villain lost control and drove off into the river. But we also had Ferris Bueller's Day Off and the Blues Brothers and Dark Knight and Chicago Fire and Chicago PD. So I think Marina City has enjoyed their filming career here. So let us go downtown to the Chase Tower Plaza. And we are very fortunate to have the Chagall Four Seasons Mosaic here in Chicago. Many, season, many cities were vying to get this mosaic, a mosaic by Chagall, 1974. It is called the Four Seasons, but but Chagall is quoted as saying, in my mind, the four seasons represent human life, physical and spiritual in different stages. It will have the skyline and seasons and festivities and celebrations. And it represents all of Chicago. And yes, this has uh, got um, thousands of inlaid chips, 250 different colors. It is restored every five years. And a canopy was put over it 20 years later in 1994, because you know, we have some pretty bad weather in Chicago and it had to protect the mosaic. We will travel to 32nd and State Street. We are now at IIT campus. This is the home of Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe, after World War II, became the director of IIT College of Architecture. And he had these modern thoughts. And yes, less is more. And there was steel frame and glass. And the IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, wanted to honor Mies van der Rohe. But they also wanted to build a new student center. And here, the new student center had a problem. The campus is straight dab right in the middle of the elevated line. Well, the campus center chose the architect Rem Koolhaas, a Dutch architect who was a professor at Harvard. And he said, no problem. He use stainless steel and concrete to make this tube. This tube lets the L track run right through it. It is going right over the ceiling, the roof of the campus center, the union, and it shields the student center from vibration and noise. It is amazing if you go in the student center, at least in the olden days, you could go in. Maybe now you need a, an ID. The ceiling is concave in shape. It's soundproof. There is no vibration at all. The side of the student center has a portrait of Mies van der Rohe. This portrait is pointillism. It is extraordinary, and it is right in a crosswalk. And this is also a doorway into the student center. When the motion centers, sensors go off, Mies van der Rohe's mouth opens wide. On the far right, you can see 
the doors are opening. And I happen to think it is extraordinary. Let's go to another location, 2004 Millennium Park. Now, prior to Millennium Park, Mayor Daly was looking out of his dentist window one day and he saw the ugly rail lines and he said, we need a park. We need to beautify the city. And yes, the best thing about Chicago is that we have wonderful friends of the mayor. And the mayor was discussing this with Penny Pritzker. And Penny Pritzker said, yes, we need a park, but we need the finest park. We need the finest architects. We need the finest sculpture artists. We need world-class artists. Let's make it special. So here in front of Cloudgate, this was called Cloudgate by the Indian born British artist Anish Kapoor. And Cloudgate because it reflects the clouds and the skyline. But we Chicagoans, we knew better. We wanted to call it the bean and it only took 10 years before Anish Kapoor said, yes, please call it the bean. But this is 66 feet long, 33 feet high. It was in 2006 when it was dedicated, the largest of its kind in the world of this reflective um, surface that Anish Kapoor made. There are now more sculptures by Anish Kapoor all over the world. Let's go to the Crown Fountains. This is done by world-class artist Yami Plensa from Barcelona. It was decided that we needed a fountain, but he took the idea, the old fashioned historic idea of the gargoyles with the water coming out of their mouths, and he incorporated it into Citizens of Chicago, 1,000 citizens of Chicago were photographed. And how did we pick our citizens? Every single nonprofit was contacted. Do you remember the old phone book? Every nonprofit was contacted and asked to send representatives of the Asian community, the Latinx community, the Black, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, you name it, we have 1,000 Chicagoans that are on the screens, the LED screens, 50 foot high, the water is recycled, it spits out of the mouths every four minutes. And what is amazing is that these individuals were photographed either in a dentist chair or when you go to the eye doctor, you put your chin in a device. And yes, they use that device to have every face and every mouth in the same position. And we are proud of the Pritzker Pavilion. It is done by the world-class artist, Frank Gehry. And this was a whole new concept in 2004, you have 120 foot high lattices going over the great lawn and attached to those were the most modern sound. Uh, you had the Bose uh, boom boxes there and they were taken in every winter. And in, after 20 years, we now installed newer speakers, but you have the finest concerts free on the lawn, and yes, this is world-class and it is extraordinary. Let's see, the largest mural in Chicago is Oprah Winfrey. It is over 300 feet in length. It is on Green Street, that is west of the Kennedy Expressway. It is, um, about two blocks west of Halstead, from Madison to Monroe on the rear of the Port Apartment Building is the Oprah Winfrey 
mural because Oprah Winfrey's Harpo Studios were here in the West Loop from 1988 to 2011. When Oprah closed the studio, the people and the businesses and the aldermen all said, we need to honor Oprah. Well, it only took 10 years. All right, 10 years, they finally came up with a plan. And who is the artist who is so fantastic, who did the most beautiful mural of Oprah? The same artist from Bronzeville, Shawn Michael Warren, did the mural of Oprah. And I, I, the, the name of the mural is Oprah and the Magpie in Wonderland. I believe magpies are symbolic of intelligence and wit, and definitely Oprah incorporates all of that. Let us see that the mural is magnificent. I highly recommend you go in the early spring, late fall, the city planted trees. If you see to the left of the magpie, there is a tree with little lights, but that photo was taken three years ago. The trees have grown amazingly well. And uh, there are a lot of leaves blocking Oprah right now. So I would not go in the heart of the summer, but let's see the largest chrysanthemum in the whole city of Chicago. This is called Herbs and Porto. It is our city motto. And the artist Wheezy Jones wanted to capture the essence of the Chicago motto, city in a garden. This is the largest chrysanthemum because Chicago's official flower is the chrysanthemum. And this is uh, south, north of Addison on Southport on the CVS. We are heading to Ukrainian village. And at Walcott, the length of Walcott at Chicago, the artist is Sean Archer. He painted a peace mural in 2021. And it is the Ukrainian folk dress. It's a symbol of the power of creation. And you see that the young lady, the Ukrainian, is throwing sunflowers to the wind. And the sunflower is the national flower. It is the symbol of peace. And that is what we hope for the Ukraine. And I'd like to close with the, uh, in the Japanese garden here, this is, uh, you see the top photo is the Museum of Science and Industry. The bottom left is the beautiful Palace of Fine Arts during the World's Columbian Exposition. And then along the, the water is where the Japanese pavilion was. Yoko Ono actually thought and thought about this. And the Japanese pavilion was destroyed by arson in 1946. And there is now the Japanese garden at that site. And Yoko Ono lived through World War II. And she said, I always loved the sky. Even when everything was falling apart around me, the sky was always there for me. It was the only constant factor in my life which kept changing with the speed of light and lightning. As I told myself then, I could never give up on life as long as the sky was there. And then Yoko Ono made this magnificent 12-foot-tall lotus petals that stretch skyward. 
in a cylindrical pattern, symbolizing peace and harmony and healing. And these beautiful lotus petals are where the Phoenix Pavilion, the Japanese Pavilion, was during the World's Columbian Exposition. It is magnificent. And I am thrilled that Yoko Ono could give this to the city of Chicago. It is called Sky Landing. It is just gives me a great deal of hope for the future. She believes that she created a gesture of peace, harmony, and healing. And on a, that positive note, I thank you for coming along on this tour tonight. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Now, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. It was wonderful. I think we have a few questions. Well, I'm going to try and answer them. <laughs> can you can you open the box or do you need me to read? I think you're going to need to do that. Okay. Um. All right. So let's start um, with a question from Bob. Bob has a couple of questions, but here's the first. When the Chicago Cultural Center Tiffany Dome was cleaned and renovated, didn't they discover that the Tiffany glass was originally installed backwards? That is what I've heard. It <laughs> is now so clear and so beautiful. And yes, they also had shielded. So you never had, uh, when I was growing up and using that as my first library, you didn't see the sunlight through it either. And now you can see the sunlight. So yes, that is what I have heard, Bob. Uh, Maria wants to know, well, this is, has to do with the recording. Maria, um, it'll be on our YouTube channel, which you can get to through the library's website. So it's just easier to just go check the channel out um, and the recording um, should be posted on there in the next couple of days. If you have a pro problem finding it, just send me an email and I can send you the link. That's wonderful. Um, and you can okay. tell your friends to check out the site too. That's right. Uh, another question from Bob. I believe that Marina City was fined every day of construction because of the way it was constructed. I never heard that one, Bob, but we could talk <laughs> about it afterwards. Uh, I heard that the reinforced concrete was uh, so new that... Uh, but I didn't hear about anybody being fined because the labor union was behind it. So I, I find that hard to believe, but we could talk about it. Okay, um, Maria, thank you. This was an excellent presentation. Thank um, you I, for coming along. Thank you, Great Variety. Thank you, Beth. This was very enjoyable. Um, and I think that's all that I have for oh, questions and comments. Um, well, it was fun. <laughs> Learned a lot. Again, the recording will be up in the next couple of days. So uh, check it out if you want to um, repeat anything that Beth uh, talked about. Um, hopefully everyone got their handouts too. So thank you, Beth, for putting that together. It's a nice compliment to the lecture. And I think we've had all of your lectures. So um, I, you probably got to start creating more. <laughs> I'll work on it. <laughs> All right. Well, it was great to work with you again, Beth. Thank you again. It was a wonderful It was fun. Thank you so much. And thank I enjoy being with you too. All thank right. You. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank have you. A, have a good night.